I'm going to talk about 10 gigabit Ethernet. It's pretty obvious. Um, just a couple things about the market and then a uh, short dig down into the technology. It's pretty straightforward um, and, pre not, I don't know, pretty, pretty straightforward, a high level overview. Uh, again, questions at the end. So I think uh, the 10, gig 10 gigabit Ethernet concept is pretty well understood. Basically, it's you know yet another iteration of the 10 to 100 to gigabit, now 10 gigabit Ethernet. And so uh, the technology is being positioned primarily in the same applications as other existing Ethernet technologies with one twist, uh, whereas some of the other Ethernet technologies have been at least nominally proposed for wide area or metropolitan area applications, 10 gigabit Ethernet has an explicit uh, phi level to run this on it and be used uh, in, a, in a wide wide area network context. I'll talk about that a little bit more. So here's just some quick overview of applications. Again, nothing too mysterious here. Basically, it's an interconnect layer between, or an interconnect technology between routers and routers and switches within, within a POP. Same place you'd use gigabit Ethernet, packet over Sonnet, or uh, ATM today uh, for uh, peering. As we move up our uh, peering to another another notch up in, in speed, either at public peering, so routers between routers switch routers interconnecting with an interconnect uh, peering switch, or as a private peering link between router co-located routers uh, in data centers. Again, for connecting either either switches which in turn connect to high speed servers or eventually, um, I don't think there are any host NICs yet at 10 gigabit Ethernet, although they're certainly purported and, and on their way. So see direct direct connect of high speed host to to the router or, or high speed switch at 10 gigi. And then again, finally, uh, as I noted, um, technology that's specifically designed to run over a sonnet or SDH uh, physical layer in a wide area or metropolitan area uh, environment. So how does 10 gigi relate to gigabit Ethernet and the other Ethernet technologies? Uh, it's the same 802.3 MAC layer and the same frame format, uh, again, just running at a higher speed, so same, uh, same standard packet sizes and such, or frame sizes. The one uh, one thing that's been happening uh, primarily in the gigabit Ethernet space is the use of jumbo frames. It's not included in the gigabit Ethernet standard, and uh, the same has been carried forward in the 802.3. That is, there's, again, no support for jumbo frames, but we expect that various vendors will, will support that, but just not part of the standard. <coughs> so kind of the same as gigabit Ethernet in that regard. Um, a difference between gigabit Ethernet and the other Ethernets and 10 gigabit Ethernet is there's no no support for half duplex mode, so no kind of a really a LAN mode. It's really a point-to-point -point framing technology in between two devices. And whereas that may not have been saying gigabit Ethernet, that's not that widely used anyway. The half duplex mode uh, in in 10 gigabit Ethernet it doesn't exist at all. And so, in conjunction with that, CSMA CD since it's a full duplex, really, it's kind of two two fibers sending back and forth to each other. There's no no need, kind of no co collisions, kind of don't exist. So you don't need CSMA CD. Uh, and some of the other Ethernet and uh, MAC technologies like uh, .1Q and uh, .3AD for various other kind of how to how to make Ethernet more more useful in different applications. Uh, those carry straight forward from uh, the other Ethernet technologies right to uh, 10 gigabit Ethernet. And also, uh, given that there's 10 gigabits, um, there's no no copper support in 10 gigi in the in the standard. So uh, something else I mentioned is a LAN a LAN phi. So that's the actually runs at a 10 gigabit per second. And then there's also a WAN phi. That's where we take some of the some of the bandwidth and use it for uh, the, the Sonnet or SDH framing. So the actual WAN phi runs a, a bit slower at 9.229 gigabits per second. Again, I'll talk about that a little bit more. So some of this is just kind of tutorial information, so I'm not going to read all this to you and just put it on the slides so you have it as a reference. 
And so Phi and PMD, I'll go to, to an architecture slide that talks about some of these things. So Phi and PMD are the physical layer and physical media dependent layer within the, the 10 gigabit Ethernet architecture. Uh, WIS is WAN interface sublayer. That's something you may see uh, as a feature that would or would not be supported within a particular interface, for example. And this is basically the, the, the adaptation sublayer to allow that uh, difference in clocking speed that I mentioned between the uh, LAN and WAN phi. Um, WWDM is you know, yet another WDM, WDM flavor. And that's specific to one of the kinds of phi's. Again, I'll point that out on one of the other charts. And then these last, uh, these last three, the X, XGMII, XAUI, are, are uh, interchip interfaces. Basically, basic, those are we're providing standard interfaces between the optics and, and chips and within the chips within an interface to uh, provide mechanisms for uh, standardization of components. And uh, so the, uh, the people building the interfaces can use a variety of off-the-shelf off the components in, in different combinations. And uh, ZenPak is a particular, uh, a particular consortium that's designed, designed a, uh, or developed an agreement for, um, for optical to electrical conversion. So that's actually a component, an off-the-shelf component for the optical, optical to electrical conversion. Again, intent. Uh, to have a standard mechanism for doing that, drive down component prices and make interfaces uh, less expensive. There are seven different uh, media types or PMDs. They're listed out here. I'm not going to go through them all in detail, but basically they just map into the different, different multi-mode and single mode uh, fiber types and also across different uh, distance requirements, uh, short reach, intermediate reach, long reach, et cetera. And then finally, the last one, and that's the WWDM that I listed on the last slide. And this is kind of a, a way to do multiplexing of, of uh, wavelengths onto the, the fiber pair. It's a little different than CWDM or, or other uh, DWDM, the way it's done. So, but again, we don't have a lot of time, so I won't go, go into the details. So this, this shows graphically some of the stuff I've been talking about. So like all 802.3s, we have a, a MAC layer interfacing, so that's what IP would run, would run over. And then in the, in, the, in the middle shows the XGMII or XAUI, those are the, the chip interfaces. And then the different phi types, the LAN phi, WAN phi. Within the LAN phi, there are the two different flavors, one with the four serial or the four, four fiber interface, WWDM, and then the standard serial LAN which is the, uh, the pair of fibers. In the case of the serial LAN, there are three different uh, physical, uh, the media dependent, so that's the, the three, different, uh, three different wavelengths and the uh, different distance requirements. And then their correspondence is corresponding for the WAN phi, but with the WAN interface sublayer uh, framing overhead for sonnet adaption. In terms of the status of the standard, things are actually pretty close. As a matter of fact, they're about as close as they could be without actually being standardized, at least unless something happens this week. So this has been happening in the 802.3 AE working group. The work started in 1999. Within IEEE, there's a concept called a project, and that allows the work to formally occur within IEEE. So that project started in January of 2002, or January of 2000, so about two and a half years ago. There's a, a status. I'm not going to go through all the gory details of IEEE the standardization process. They all vary different. You know, it's different from IETF. I leave it at that. And um, there's a web page there that points to where you can see how that all works. But basically, it's a sponsor ballot status now. Draft 4.3 is the current version. And um, it's. I would say this is probably not um, strong enough language, but significant changes are unlikely at this point. Um, even Minor minor changes are pretty unlikely at this point. The final ratification of the standard is supposed to happen this week at one of the I, other IEEE meetings. So um, as long as that happens, then it just it takes a, a couple more months for them to do some more editorial cleanup and things like that, at least potentially, and then actually issue the standard. But uh, basically, it's done. Um, from an interoperability perspective, uh, at Interop in May, so a, a month or so ago. 
they, they had a one of the regular interop uh, test demo kind of things. So uh, in the actual equipment demo, the, their, their press release said something like 24 vendors participants or 24 participants or something like that. But if you read it more more closely, some of that was equipment vendors, some of it was chip vendors talking about the different kinds of chip interoperability and things like that. But anyway, a bunch of different equipment was connected together at Interop in uh, in May. And there's, a, again, the press release, the web page is there, so you can kind of check that out and see what the exact status was. Um, so just to wrap things up, it's pretty viable, uh, at least at least uh, from a Juniper perspective, we, we think so. Um, the standard is basically complete. Uh, products are shipping, including switch interfaces, router interfaces, test equipment, um, the appropriate cables, kind of all the pieces that you need to uh, deploy 10 gig e are, are pretty much ready. And uh, with any technology, of course, it's, this is new, however, so there will probably be at least uh, a little bit of uh, ongoing ongoing potholes in, in, the, in the road. So make sure you check for interoperability and things like that before you uh, go too overboard. There are some, some interoperability testing happening at the University of New Hampshire Interoperability Lab and, of course, Interop. Uh, the interoperability test results, of course, are trade show interoperability results. So take those with a grain of salt. You know, those are done with all the carefully crafted smoke and mirrors and all that stuff. But the UNH test results are usually pretty pretty solid. And, of course, um, products are still just coming on the market now, so you need to test for uh, maturity in that regard also. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So there, there may be products that are just evolution of other, you know, gigabit Ethernet products and things like that, so uh, check for performance uh, as you as you uh, are doing your product selection in this space. This last slide just shows a bunch of uh, reference websites the IEEE, IEEE website, uh, 10 gig GEA is the gig 10 gigabit Ethernet Alliance, and so that's uh, both some market materials, some white papers, and things like that that provide technology overview. Um, Ethermanage.com is uh, Charles Spurgeon's website from the University of Texas. Uh, lots of really good information about Ethernet in general, 10 gig and others. Uh, this next one is the University of New Hampshire Interoperability Lab. And they've been doing a pretty good job at putting up a lot more tutorial information on that web page, uh, including some uh, fairly technical tutorials about the details of 10 gig e. Uh, there's the Zenpack web page that talks about that that component. And then there was a, a workshop at uh, the San Diego Shipping Peter Center on uh, deployment of 10 gigabit Ethernet. Uh, I guess it was last fall or something. And uh, again, so a bunch of presentations are are there that provides some perspective on the use of 10 gigi, uh, including 10 gigi in the WAN and how it might how it might fit. So uh, I guess that is all I have. I think I went through fast enough to bring us in time for lunch. And we have Mr. Bill Woodcock walking up to the microphone for a question. Do I do a little bit of prognostication? Do I want to? Yeah. Sure, whatever. OK. Depends. So I mean, I, I'm copper. Um, you say? Not in standard. So right. is this going to be sort of like Gigi was, where you know, a year, two years from now, the problems of physics will be overcome by force of money, and we'll have, you know, meter, two meter, three meter, copper interconnects. Yeah, that's a pretty good question. I think it actually relates to some of the other, um, to another question which I thought you was what you may have asked. So I'll answer your question and the other question in anticipation. Um, which is basically cost, right? The, the, one of the motivations for doing something like that would be would be cost uh, for the interfaces themselves, uh, uh, and presumably, I guess fiber is not that much more expensive than copper these days. But at least the interfaces would presumably be, be cheaper. So, um, you know, will it will it happen? I don't know. I'm not a I'm not a physics guy. Uh, is it is it possible? You know, I'm not going to deny that it's that it's possible. I think it's certainly within the realm of possibility. I mean, we build interconnects inside the routers and stuff like that that certainly run at those kinds of speeds. So, um, so uh, the question is, is you know, could we really build it cheaper? Um, if we look at a, an interface, the costs are in 
there's there's a bunch of pieces in the cost, and this kind of relates to the other question, right? There's buffering, there's some kind of forwarding engine, or at least a, some mechanism for uh, taking the, the frames off the off the physical media and then sending them into the switch fabric, et cetera. Yeah, go ahead. For those in the audience who don't know, could you give people some idea of what the cost of an interface is right now? <laughs> wow. That's a good question. Um, that's a good question. You know, we just announced ours, and I really have no idea what it costs. I'm not a sales guy, or any any Juniper people, or any anybody else in the audience from any vendors who could provide some insight. I I, I just don't know. At least at least uh, I know ours 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 are at least not dramatically less expensive than um, the 10 gigabit uh, solid interfaces. It's not the kind of order of magnitude difference that people were anticipating, or at least some some were promoting that you know Ethernet's going to be so vastly cheaper than than Sonnet that you'll get it for free relative, um, and and that's kind of where I was going. Basically, if you look at an interface cost, a lot of the pieces are all the same. The optics are the same. The framers are slightly different, but close. Especially if you're using the WAN 5 for 10 gigabit Ethernet and then you need to put buffering on the interface and all the other stuff, right? So it, it kind of is a wash from our perspective in terms of component costs. Yeah. Um, there's a perception that uh, in producing the standard, um, they, they screwed up and that there's a, a, a essentially a LAN version and a WAN version. The advantage of gigabit Ethernet was that the chips were produced in mass quantity and therefore were cheap. So by having two versions, one which is applicable to the LAN, if that one is mass produced and the other one isn't, then it doesn't have the advantage of being cheap. And since they only put the um, error detection in the one that's not cheap, then there's no incentive to not just use Sonnet. Right, right. Well, actually, a couple of comments on that. Uh, I think you're, you're right on track. Uh, and it's really in this case the optics are becoming the dominant, the, the dominant piece, and it's again kind of the same, right? And if you start using WAN, WAN FIs, then um, about the only thing you do is you, you just get a little more overhead for for sonnet framing and the error correction. It, one of the other things which I didn't put in, in the presentation because uh, is there there is some error as well. I guess it's better characterizes fault monitoring and link monitoring in 10 gig E at a link level, which is new also. So it's kind of a little better than than uh, the other Ethernet uh, technologies in, in that regard. So, yeah. Just wondering if we could do a show of hands of people interested in deploying the 10 gig uh, interfaces in the short term. Uh, 10 gigabit Ethernet? Yeah. Sure. Whatever. So, if you're interested in deploying 10 gigabit Ethernet interfaces in the short term, being calendar year 2002, say, raise your hand. Was that helpful? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I guess we're. I don't see any other questions. So, thanks very much. <laughs>